Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to thank Rosemary, first off, for inviting me on Instruments of Peace. Um, and I really admire the work that she's done in, cre in creating this event. Um, my talk today will be quite different, I think, to what you will have heard earlier on. Um, visible silence. What do I mean by, vi by visible silence? Why is this concept needed? As a definition, visible silence is a unique forum for young people to acknowledge, learn, and grow from systemic problems in Irish society, both past and present. An interactive space between the community, academia, and popular culture. I want to envision, in, envision this to interlink but are disconnected generations. Visible science demands that we ask sensitive questions that probe deep moral powers within us. So for the next 20 minutes, I'd like to talk about why I believe this concept is needed. And I'll be touching on some unique differences that our generation has, um, unlike previous generations. And I'll be briefly touching upon a sociological theory called compartmentalization theory. If I may, I'd then like to apply this to a very specific example uh, of an Irish tragedy, really. One which really compelled me to, 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 to start this concept. And that's the clerical sex abuse scandals, which uh, really hit the international headlines in May 2009. And then I'd like to finish by talking about how I'd like to develop this, this, this concept. Uh, I'm delighted to see some young people here today as well, because Anne, I'd like to dedicate this lecture to them. So, young people in Ireland today. Mass change, globalization, technology, everything has changed. Uh, we're always being told about the good and the bad um, of such changes. Um, we're living in a world where we've come from, where the state prioritizes our education, free education. Um, we have increased choice, increased information, we have everything. We've experienced a boom, and now we've transitioned in, into a time where my generation will be paying for the mistakes of bankers for the foreseeable future. What else has changed? So here's a visual illustration of uh, one of the biggest social media giants at the moment, Facebook, and the, inter the interconnectedness between young people across the world. Something that we wouldn't even be able to imagine 10, 15 years ago. Or even the young people in the room today. Can you imagine, can you imagine flirting with someone without having texting? Completely different. Social dynamics completely changed. The one point I want to make about this is the speed at which this has changed means that we haven't caught up on the social dynamics. What are the effects of all this mass change on the small problems and the big problems? Let's look at the Growing Up and Learning study, a longitudinal study of 20,000 Irish children. One of the main differences that they found is the presence of a computer in the home and the effects that it is having on their childhood. So you can see there for 15% of nine-year-olds, emailing is the primary use of the computer. So they're obviously busy with something. These are nine-year-olds. So as I was saying, the effects of this, we don't really know. Of course, there are good effects, of course, there are bad effects. There are no rules or norms as a consequence. There's a second self that we are, our human relations are being mediated by technology. Information choice overload, hyper surveillance. The very existence of such technology means that we're being surveyed the whole time. And there was teams of this in the, in the News of the World scandal during the summer also the London rioting, and also the Norwegian scandal as well. Roughly based on this sort of dynamic, I've been writing about what I have ter initially termed compartmentalization theory, which li was literally just saying that because of the explosion of this sort of techno-informational society, young people today, a global awareness of all, all these problems alongside their, their own ambitions in life, have had to find a, a way of dealing with, with all these different phenomena. So we have developed a, t a capacity to label, digest, and store everything that, that is going on, be it 
the global financial crisis and how that affects our life, and be it how Facebook is affecting our friendship and relationships, everything. And I'd like to apply this roughly to, uh, to my next example. But before that, as I'm sure you'll have engaged with earlier today, peace, I personally believe peace is what you make. Peace can be defined in many different ways, depending on where, where we're living, depending on experiences. And I've given some examples here of, 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 of some, some potential definitions of peace. And I think you'll find that all of these have been denied in the, in the next example. So May 2009, uh, the Ryan Report, as is popularly known, uh, charted what was, what some victims called an Irish Holocaust. I've quoted the Irish Times here, saying that the instinct to turn away from it, repelled by its profoundly unsettling ugliness, was almost irresistible. We owe it, though, to those who suffered they are to acknowledge from now on that it is an inescapable part of Irish reality. When studying sociology in 2009, it literally felt like it was theory coming to life with some of the things I was studying. And I was very disappointed and surprised, if nothing else, at how my generation responded. So what was the response? Obviously mass shock, pain, disbelief internationally. It re-highlighted re to me the damaging gap between what is essentially elitist academia, society, and our cultural practices. How can a Facebook page saying, I'm glad I'm not in Joseph Fritzl's basement, have 40,000 members, and yet there is no forum for young people to really get to grips with what this incomprehensible story is. The media, also through the techno-informational society kind of format that I'm talking about, has created a church versus state versus victim arena, um, which, is, as I'm sure many people would agree, is just completely oversimplifying things. But I'm more interested in where Ireland's young people were in response to this. So the 2006 Irish census uh, shows that out of a population of just over 4.2 million, uh, 3.6 of us are Roman Catholics. But if we go to a church on Sunday, does this prove this? I see Ireland as couch Catholic Ireland. Is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? What does this mean? What does this say about our generation? Is it fair to, have, to hold the view that being a member of Couch Catholic Ireland is indirectly facilitating the power of the Catholic Church and thus fueling what were essentially cover-ups. Is that unfair? Yet in popular culture, it's a, abuse themes are alive and well, for example. As we can see in novels, Room, The Slap, and Michael O'Brien, picture at the top here, uh, with his famous out outbursts on questions and answers, really honed in on people's psyche and really got them focused on, on the emotions of, of, of this scandal. So for the Little Children um, by Rafferty and O'Sullivan really provoked the state to fund a commission which eventually led to these scandals erupting, er erupting internationally. So based on all this, I'm calling for a forum. You might disagree with some of the points that I'm making. You might think my tone, you might think my slant on it is skewed. That's irrelevant. What is relevant is calling for a forum to argue this and ask the sensitive questions and not retreat this way or this way. It's a very early stage idea. And I've initially started, in, I started planning an engaging lecture series with some academics to break down this divide between academia and society and to encourage all young people to come and ask the questions which there's no real outlet for. An interactive website is under development to invite people to write, bring academics together as well. 
nationwide debates. Why are you a couch Catholic? I want to gauge response of young people and hopefully publish something thereafter. And the lessons that we learn, the insights that we get, painful or otherwise, we can creatively indent them in our culture. From talking with some of the victims, they don't want money, they don't even want recognition. They want to understand the whys. They want to prevent our generation from having to endure the unspeakable. So that's why I'd like to really engage with what are essentially three cheesy words, acknowledge, learn, and grow. And I hope physical silence can facilitate that. And thank you very much for listening to me.